Thank you for coming out to these. This is seventh annual. Nine. Nine. Oh my gosh. Ninth annual Student Scholar Days. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our very first speaker, and that's Kevin Shanks. Um, Kevin uh, is a senior in the biology department, and um, I've had the pleasure to work with uh, Kevin over the last year on this um, project that he's been really uh, taking charge of it, and he's done a great job uh, showing initiative in collecting data, um, analyzing the data, and putting a really nice um, presentation for you here today. So let's welcome Kevin. Hi, I'm going to be presenting an independent study project that I and my co-author, Dr. Graham, have been doing over the past year. So what we did was we were measuring the water uptake in response to nitrogen in Fasciolus vulgaris. So first I'll talk about the importance of nitrogen within plants. Then we'll move on to Fasciolus vulgaris and the rhizobium interaction. The water uptake in response to nitrogen, and finally, my experiment. So, nitrogen is a very important nutrient within plants. Now, they use this in sexual reproduction, DNA synthesis, and it is required in very high quantities and is a limiting factor for plants. Nitrogen levels directly associated with chlorophyll levels, biomass levels, and seed and fruit development. So as the level of nitrogen increases, so does the amount of chlorophyll, amount of biomass, and seed and fruit development. Atmospheric nitrogen, N2, is unavailable for plant use. So they need a different form of nitrogen, which is ammonium or nitrate, to directly absorb. Rhizobium is a nitrogen-fixing microorganism. It is found naturally in soils and it converts atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium and nitrate. So plants use this in order to, they, they form a, an association with these rhizobium and it helps the plants absorb nitrogen levels. Fasciolus vulgaris is a type of legume plant that does so. It forms this association with the rhizobium bacteria. It is more commonly known as the pinto bean and the flowering time for these plants is four weeks. As flowering occurs, there's an increase in nitrogen need within the plant. P. vulgaris and the rhizobium have a symbiotic relationship in which both of them benefit. So the plant obtains a nitrate source and the rhizobium obtain a carbon source and a home. Now, these rhizobium are housed within nodules, and within the nodules is where the nitrogen fixation is taking place. Here is a picture of the nodules in, on the roots of a leguminous plant, and right here is the cross-section of one of these nodules, and the red coloring is an indication of nitrogen fixation. Now, the legume-rhizobium interaction is agriculturally important because it is one of the most abundant known, ab abundantly used rhizobium interaction within agriculture. In previous studies done by Gorska et al., they used a cucumber plant and a tomato. As they used a split root technique, they saw that with increased nitrogen levels, they saw an increase in water uptake. Now, in my experiment, I believe there will be a difference in or water uptake in the introduction of nitrogen with legumes grown with rhizobium and legumes grown without le rhizobium. Plants were inoculated with the rhizobium, rhizobium plants and non-rhizobium plants were grown for two, four, and six week growth stages. And they were tested throughout those stages. Now, we used a split root technique as the Gorska et al. used and what we did was we chose a plant to start and what this plant was chosen by was the quality of its roots. The roots were rinsed and placed in a low nitrogen solution for 24 hours and after 24 hours this plant was used within the study and the roots were split evenly in half or by eye as evenly as possible and placed in two separation funnels on each side. Now the separation funnels led to a beaker 
and the, under the beaker was a balance, which this measured the uptake of water from each plant. Now, each of the separation flasks and the beakers were filled with low nitrogen solution. For the first trial, the five milliliters of high nitrogen solution was added directly to one side of the separation funnels. Readings were taken every 15 minutes for 60 minutes. Then, after the first trial, the high nitrogen solution was flushed out and refilled with low nitrogen solution and five milliliters was put into the opposite side of high nitrogen solution. So this acted as its own control so that each side of the roots was in a high nitrate environment to see the difference in the uptake. Now here are the solutions used within, the my, within my experiment. The low nitrate solution and the high nitrate solution. You have 2,000 milliliters of low nitrogen solution because we used a lot more of it to fill the separation funnels and the beakers. And we made about five mil 500 milliliters of the high nitrate solution because five milliliters of the high nitrate was added each time. So not much was used. Now what we're looking at here is what's underlined in red is the difference in the nitrate levels. So CaNO3 2 and KNO3 were the source of your nitrate levels. And as you can see in the high nitrate, we're much higher, especially because we only made 500 milliliters of the solution. For the data of my experiment, the plants with rhizobium, the, on the x-axis you see the two, four, and six week growth stages. And on the y-axis you see the water uptake in grams. Now what this was, was the starting value on the scale su subtracted by the final value on the scale. So that would give you your uptake in grams. Now, above are the p-values of significance. And for the first two weeks of the rhizobium plant, you saw that they took up the low nitrogen solution to start. Now, they continued to do so and took up more and more of this low nitrate solution throughout four and six week periods. Now, the plants without the rhizobium is the same setup of the graph. The high nitrate is in the gold and the low nitrate in the black. We saw in the first two weeks that the non-rhizobium plants took up low nitrogen solution more than the high nitrate solution. Now, at a four-week mark, there was an equal amount or close to an equal amount taken up of each side. So it didn't have a preference of what it was taking up. And in the sixth week, you saw an increase substantially of the high nitrate solution absorbed versus the low nitrate solution. Now this graph is showing the high nitrate solution uptake minus the low nitrate solution uptake. So on the y-axis you see the water uptake difference and the negative value is because they took up more of the low nitrate solution than the high. So both the rhizobium in red and the non-rhizobium in green started about the same amount. At the four-week period, again, there was no preference in the non-rhizobium, but the rhizobium plant took up more of the low nitrate solution. And in the six-week period, the rhizobium continued to take up more of the low nitrate solution. And in the six-week period for the non-rhizobium, took up substantially more of the high nitrate solution. Now, this supports the hypothesis that there was a difference in water uptake due to nitrogen in the plants. In the two-week growth stage of the non-rhizobium, the uptake of the low nitrate solution may have been because over time these plants have developed with the rhizobium and may have evolved a mechanism in which they can regulate the amount of nitrogen uptake within their water channels. In the four and six week growth stages, we saw that they took up more of the high nitrate solution than they did in the first two weeks. Now this may be because of flowering time and nodule formation. So flowering time takes about four weeks and nodule formation also takes four weeks. So the increase in nitrogen need in flowering time would increase or 
g coincide with the absence of, a no if of the nodules. So when they realize they have low nitrogen levels, they, they mediate a response on a whole plant level that allows them to seek out a solution to this problem and absorb the high nitrate levels. Now this may support a theory of inhibition of the water channels. So to start, you have the two weeks, two week period of low nitrate absorption in the non resobium plants. Now, since they were in, or if they were inhibiting the water channels, then in the four and six week periods, the low, low levels of nitrogen would cause the repressor or the translation of the repressor to be inhibited. So the gene or group of genes in question here may be the alkaporin or the water channel genes. Now, what this would do, would, it would bypass the mechanism in which they regulate the nitrogen uptake and so they could take up as much high nitrogen as possible. For the rhizobium plants, you saw a consistent uptake of the low nitrogen solution. Now, this may be because of the presence of rhizobium. So with the presence of rhizobium, they realize that they have a sufficient source of nitrogen and they have developed this reliability over time and evolution with this organism, the rhizobium. This also supports the theory of a presence of a regulation method. So with their reliability of the nitrate source, they're able to suppress the environmental nitrogen source and Due to that, they do not take up the environmental high nitrogen source. Now, you might ask, why would a plant not take up as much nitrogen as possible since it is so beneficial? Well, too much of nitrogen can be a bad thing, just like too much of water can be a bad thing. Now, what too, no, too much nitrogen does within a plant is you can get plant burn or leaf burn. And this is caused by too many chlorophyll molecules absorbing too much light and it causes the, the leaves to burn. Now also with the allocation of energy to the increased biomass or excess foliage, you have decreased allocation of energy to other organs of the plant. So you have decreased allocation of energy to your roots and sexual organs. And a plant with no sexual organs or underdeveloped sexual, sexual organs is useless. So, also, with the decreased allocation of energy to the roots, this would destabilize or decrease the amount of outward growth within the roots, causing the destabilization of the plant, which may have or lead to the plant falling over, or a decreased energy to the defense mechanisms to pathogens and disease. The use of this mechanism or relationship is important in future agriculture because if we understand it more, we would be able to use this in our future agriculture instead of the use of industrial fertilizer. Now what industrial fertilizer does is they dump extreme amounts into the ground and this causes cultural eutrophication as it leaks out into the ecosystem. So when you decrease the industrial fertilizer use, you'd have less impact on the ecosystem and you can even grow these legumes with the rhizobium interaction with other crops to supplement nitrogen to the plants. Here are my references. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>